Broccoli and also it's cauliflower. Chicken parmesan. Mom's Sometimes go to Grand Forks and shop around. Craft with her and spend time with her. Having a good day. Point to do it. Taking care of the animals. Go shopping on Amazon. Go shopping. Snuggle. 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 Go shopping. Snuggle. She picks out sometimes. This is do my chores. We do chicks and ducks, water food. We do our chores. Oh, um, clean your room, do your homework, do your chores. Go clean the chicken coop with me. Go clean the chicken duck coop now. Wash my hands. Uh, clean up, put my butter. Clean up. Dishes. Keep doing them. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. is what I actually do them without a, without her having to ask. Spending time with her and crafting with her and playing games. Happy birthday. Everything. Hugs. 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 Give my mom a kiss. Compliment. With whenever it's messy and it's still messy, so she might help me. Supporting us, even when we feel down. Drawing, crafting, and singing. Sharks and minnows. Everything. Tennis. Playing a game. Being a mom. Tennis. Tennis. Cooking. Snuggling. Emma. Do it with me. Happy Mother's Day, Mom! Happy Mother's Day, Mom! I love you, Mama! How big the universe is! How big everything is! <laughs> love you, Mommy! We love hope you have a good Mother's Day! Love you! Hope you have a good Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day, Mom! Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day. I'm sure you enjoyed the videos beforehand this morning. I'm thankful to everyone that did that, and especially to the guys uh, who do our sound and media and just setting things like that up every week. We are glad to be together, even though we do it from afar. I'm so glad that our God accepts our worship no matter where we are and no matter what day of the week it is. And that's what we want to do this morning. We just want to praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Sing with us this morning. Let's sing these words together. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear now to His temple draw
this song, church. Bless the Lord no matter what's going on, good and the bad. We have so much to bless him for. Sing this with us. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out of, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I reads almost every morning from a John Piper devotional and what's interesting is his one this week talked about faith in light of what's going on in our world and I was doing some reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and I found these verses I think that address what's going on real well it says and I when I came to you brothers did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in wisdom and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, 
so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I love those verses because it reminds us that our faith doesn't rest in what's going on in the world, does it? In the wisdom of men, but in God. And even farther down, it talks about the rulers of this age are doomed to pass away, but God is eternal. He is mighty to save, and that's what he's done. So sing that with us this morning, church. God has so much mercy. We want to just praise him for that. Sing with us. Here we go. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. A new every morn. Our 
as we are thankful for the words of those songs. God, I am so thankful every day that you are in control. I'm thankful that you are a loving God, a holy God, a righteous God, a God who is aware of our sin, and a God who, because of our sin, could turn your back on us. But you didn't do that, God. Our sins are many, but your mercy is more. And I'm so, I'm so, so thankful for that, Father. We spend time these weeks and the next few weeks ahead in the Old Testament, and boy, oh boy, do the Israelite people give us a lot of things to learn from. And in so many ways, God, we are like them. We follow you, and then we sin, and then we follow you, and then we sin. And God, I pray that you would just increase our faith so so those things are less, that we follow you more and we sin less, God. Work in our hearts and lives, no matter what's going on. 
God, I would pray strongly against fear this morning. I, I think fear just sweeps over us. And, and God, when we depend on you, we realize that we don't have to fear. So work against the spirit of fear, God. And I pray we'd, we would we'd just see truth, God, in who you are. Bless our brother, Mark, as he opens your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is good to be together again this week to worship and praise our Heavenly Father. I want to give a special Happy Mother's Day greeting to all of our moms. Moms have a special role in our lives, and it's great to be able to celebrate them. Even though my mom passed away a few years ago and is in heaven today, she had an impact on my life, and I appreciate watching her love Jesus throughout her life. Today, we're entering into the second of three weeks of our Walk Through the Bible Old Testament series. Hopefully, you had a chance to take a look and dig a little deeper into the, some of the passages that we talked about. Well, last week, we covered the book of Genesis, and if you remember, the theme of the book of Genesis is beginnings. We also talked about four people and four events that brought us through the book of Genesis. I've recruited the worship team to help us out to do a little review of our hand signs. So at home, stand up with us. Let's do these together. All right, everybody ready? Here we go. Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. This week, we are gonna cover the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The theme that we'll be talking about today is called wandering, as the nation of Israel wandered for those 40 years before entering into the promised land. The book of Genesis ends with the nation of Israel in Egypt due to the famine that was widespread in the land at that time. And as if, if you remember Joseph's brothers and uh, his father Jacob, and their families all moved to Egypt at that time. And God used Joseph to preserve a remnant. When the people first came to Egypt, there was about 70 in all. While enjoying favor in Egypt, the nation of Israel grew and continued to multiply. As time went on, Joseph passed away. The Pharaoh that welcomed the Israelites passed away. We're told that a new Pharaoh was raised up, but he knew nothing about Joseph. And this Pharaoh saw the Israelite nation as enemies rather than friends. As he looks at the number of Israelites that are there versus the number of Egyptians, he's afraid that if they turned against Egypt, or join with any other nations, they would defeat Egypt and take over the nation. In order to stop that, this new Pharaoh put the people of Israel into bondage, into slavery, to work for the Pharaoh, to build up the nation of Egypt. Now, ultimately, 
the people of Israel end up in Egypt for about 400 years, and they are under heavy burden of slavery from the Egyptian pharaoh and his taskmasters. In the beginning chapters of the book of Exodus, we see the Israelite people have cried out to God for a deliverer, cried for someone to rescue them from this burden of slavery. And we're told that God remembered his covenant, the one that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God would send a deliverer whose name was Moses. Now, we're first introduced to Moses not as a deliverer, but as a baby. He was born during a time when the pharaoh of Egypt had a command that said, any Israelite baby boys that were born should be killed, that would be put to death. But Moses' mother hid him for as long as she could. When she could hide him no longer, she put him in a basket, placed that basket in the Nile River, and Pharaoh's daughter, when she was out going into the river, she saw the basket and opened it up and saw this baby boy, this Israelite baby boy crying. And it says she had pity on him. And I like this part. Moses' sister was watching this happen. Watched Pharaoh's daughter take this baby out of the water. And as she did, Moses' sister went up and said, should I call one of the Israelite women to nurse and take care of this baby? Moses ended up being raised in his early days by his own mother until he was old enough to go and live and become part of Pharaoh's family. Moses spent the first 40 years of his life in power in Pharaoh's household. But that ended one day while Moses was watching the work being done. He watched an Egyptian taskmaster beating an Israelite And Moses went and killed the Egyptian taskmaster. Pharaoh heard about that and tried to kill Moses. Moses fled Egypt to save his life, and he spent the next 40 years of his life in Midian, tending sheep of his father-in-law. One day while he was tending the sheep, Moses sees a bush that is burning, but it's not being burnt up. He turns aside to see that, and as he gets closer, he hears those words, to remove his shoes, for he is standing on holy ground. From the midst of that burning bush, God calls Moses to go and tell Pharaoh to let his people go, so that they may serve God, that they could worship him. Now, put yourself in Moses' shoes just for a moment. Could you imagine being there, knowing what had happened in Egypt before that. And now God is saying, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, to let the Israelites go. Moses comes up with excuse after excuse why he's not the one that should go. He's not the man for the job. I can't speak. Moses said, the people won't believe me. Or who am I that I should even go? Finally, Moses, in essence, says, send someone else. But God answers each of Moses' objections and lets Moses know that he's the one that God wants to go, to be the deliverer, to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. God wants Moses to go and deliver that message and to help free the Israelite people. And he let Moses know that he would be with him, that he would give him the words to say, that it would be God's power that's working through Moses at that time. You know, Moses maybe didn't feel adequate. Maybe there was fear to carry out what God had asked him to do. Maybe you and I face that same thing sometimes. Maybe we don't feel adequate or maybe we're fearful of doing something that God maybe is calling us to do. We, like Moses, 
may say or pray and ask God to send someone else, or maybe we come up with excuse after excuse. But like Moses, God is also going to be with us. He's going to give us the words to say, the strength that we need, the courage that we need, no matter what the situation is. Now, we might not lead people out of bondage in Egypt, but God does want us to be witnesses for him, to tell others about Jesus so that they can be set free from the bondage of sin. Now, Moses finally did go. And when we think of Moses, one of the things that we think of is the staff that he had. The staff was one of the things that God used to demonstrate his power through Moses. Now, the sign that we're going to use for Moses is this. You're going to take the staff in your right hand, and you're just going to hold it up, and you're going to say, Moses. But as we do, we know that God is powerful and he used Moses, so we want to put a little bit behind that. So grab the staff, we're going to push it forward, and we're going to say, Moses. So let's do that together. Ready? Here we go. Moses. God used Moses to deliver the people from Egypt. But it wasn't quite that simple. Moses went to Pharaoh with God's command to let the people go so that they could worship God. And the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. He refused to let the people go. And Pharaoh says, no, they can't go. To move Pharaoh to release the Israelites, God showed his power through a series of plagues. But despite the frogs, the hail, the darkness, and other plagues, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart and refused to let the people go. Now, my mom always told me that there are no bad questions to ask. But as Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go, I think Pharaoh asked a bad question. Here was the question that he asked. Who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? Pharaoh will see God's power and will let the Israelites go. When the last of the plagues, the death of the firstborn, kills of the firstborn child in every Egyptian household, when the Lord passes through the land, Pharaoh lets the people go. While God was striking the land of Egypt, he made a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians. God would protect the Israelites from this judgment, from the death of the firstborn. God told Moses to tell the Israelites to take an unblemished, to take a spotless lamb and kill it and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lintels of their houses, which they did. So put it on the doorpost, across the top, and on the other side to put that blood there. And as the Lord passed by, he would pass over that house when he saw the blood, and no Israelite firstborn would be killed. They were saved by the blood of the Lamb. And maybe not just an issue of blood, but one of faith, as the people trusted in what God had said, and they did it. They trusted that God was faithful to his word, and that's called the Passover. So the hand sign that we have for that is just simply this. We're going to start with your right hand. You're going to start over on the left side. We're just going to say, pass over. Let's do it one more time. Pass over. So let's put those two together. Moses, Passover. And so those are the first two signs uh, for today. Now, the Passover is one of the places in the Old Testament that paints a picture of the New Testament Passover lamb of Jesus. The Passover is a powerful story and a picture of what Christ has done for us by taking our sin on himself and dying on the cross in our place. So that we, if we put our faith and trust in Christ and what he's done, we can be saved by the blood of the lamb. 
just want to pause here for a little bit. I want to show us a series of slides about the Passover, looking at the Passover in the Old Testament and Jesus as our Passover lamb. So let's take a look. In the Old Testament, we have an instruction to sacrifice. It says, take a lamb and kill it. Those verses are found in Exodus chapter 12. In the New Testament, we see this. We see, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, found in John 1.29. And we needed a sacrifice for our sins. And this is pointing us, this verse is pointing us to Jesus. The condition of the sacrifice in the Old Testament, your lamb shall be without blemish. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter 1.19, it says, the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ lived a sinless life. Jesus lived a sinless life. I'm the one that has sin. We're the ones that have sin. And we can't pay that price on our own. We needed Jesus to come and pay and be that sacrifice for us. The reason for the sacrifice in the book of Exodus, it says, I will execute judgment. Jesus or the Lord was going to pass through. And in the New Testament, in Hebrews 9, 27, it says this, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. But because of God's love for us, he chose to send his son because we've all sinned and we need that sacrifice. The application of the sacrifice in the Old Testament, every man shall take for himself a lamb. And in the New Testament, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So there's a time when we put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, it said every man shall take for himself a lamb. There was a personal decision that had to be made to trust what God had said, to take that lamb. And same for us. There's a time when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. The result of the sacrifice, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And in the New Testament, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. As we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, he forgives us our sins and cleanses us from our sins and doesn't hold that against us anymore. And 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, For indeed, Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. And so this leads me to just ask a couple of important questions that we all need to answer. Just like these two events are key, the Passover and, and Jesus coming, a key moment in our life is what we think of Jesus. Warren Wearsby, who writes some commentaries, asks the question, what do you think of Christ? Jesus, Jesus even asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? It's a defining, defining moment in our lives. Where are we with Christ? So two questions. Have you come to realize that Jesus is the Passover lamb who sacrificed his life for you? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And the second question is this. Have you put, figuratively, the blood on your door by personally receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Passover lamb? Have you trusted him in the work that he did to pay the penalty for our sin? If you have done that, I would just invite you just to thank him for what he's done for us, the sacrifice that he made, the love that he showed if it's maybe something that you have not done, I'd invite you to consider what he has done for you on the cross 
and that there is salvation found in no one else. And there's no better time than now to invite him into our life to forgive our sins. If you have questions on that, I'd invite you to call one of the pastors or one of the elders just to talk about that. So let's review those two hand signs one more time. So here they are, Moses, Passover. Moses and Passover. So after the Passover, Pharaoh let the people go. God delivered the children of Israel from bondage and slavery. They left Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea on dry ground. He parted the waters, and they escaped Pharaoh's army, who had a change of heart after they let the Israelites go. God led them to Mount Sinai, where he showed them how to live as his people. At Mount Sinai, they receive two things— The first is their charter as a nation, and that is the law. The charter is their nation, they receive the law, and the hand sign for that is just simply this. Like you're holding a book and you say, law. So just open the book and it's law. That's one of the things he gave them. God's law reflects his character and how his people should live to be different from the other nations around them to be a witness to them for a holy God. It taught them to live lives pointing to a holy God that is worthy of worship. Now, the second thing that God gives Moses is the blueprint for a traveling tent, which would be their place of worship in the wilderness called the tabernacle. So here's the hand sign for that. You maybe remember this from Sunday school, but just put your hands, interlock your fingers, and make a steeple, and we're just going to say tabernacle. So the two things that God gave to the Israelite people, the law and the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle of tent of meeting is described in Scripture as a place of fine linens and fabrics, gold, bronze, silver, but more importantly, It was where God would dwell with his people. We're told that his glory filled the temple, filled the tabernacle where he met with his people. In Exodus 25, 8, God said, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell with them. And the tabernacle would be that place where God can meet with his people. A couple of years ago, as I was reading through the Bible, And the Bible I was using had a a few notes at the bottom of each section. And after reading about the tabernacle, one of the notes that I read said this. The fact that God even designated a meeting place for his people demonstrated how relentlessly he desired their fellowship. He did not abandon the human race after the fall, during the flood, or because of the foolishness at Babel. Instead, he led his people out of slavery and built a worship center where they would be able to commune with a relentlessly loving God. What a great thought that God just continues to pursue the Israelite people, but us as well. He loves us and he wants to have a relationship with us. And that brings us through the book of Exodus. Now, our theme As we've talked about last week, we saw Genesis, and Walk Through the Bible uses some pictures, some brain teaser type of pictures. And so Exodus, we see the theme is exit. They exited Egypt and were on their way to the promised land. Let's do those four hand signs real quick. So we have Moses, Passover, Law, Tabernacle. So at Mount Sinai, God not only gave the people the law and the tabernacle, he also picked one tribe, one family from Jacob's sons that he would appoint to serve as priests. The tribe of Levi was chosen, and the priests were called to represent the people to God and God to the people. They oversaw Two ways God gave the people to relate to him. They were through offerings 
and feasts. And we find that in the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus, there were five offerings and there were seven feasts. And so our next hand sign is just simply this. We're just going to hold up with our left hand. We're going to say offerings and feasts. And we're giving those offerings and feasts to the Heavenly Father, to God, to thank Him for what He's done, to remember what He has done. So it's just simply offerings and feasts. The, the offerings, um, some of those were voluntary, others were mandatory, some were for atonement of sins, and others were for worshiping God and to signify their devotion to Him. Some of the offerings, or some of the feasts, I'm sorry, were times of national celebration for God's goodness in the history of the nation. Times to remember what God had done, how he had led them, how he had provided for them. You know, we might not have a a special uh, feast or something like that, like it is in the Bible, but we do have things, and it's important for us to remember his goodness, his faithfulness, to thank him for the things that he has done in our lives, to thank him for how he has led us and how he has provided for us that he gave his son. One of the main themes in Leviticus is God's holiness. God gave the Israelites the offerings and feasts so they could have a way to seek forgiveness, ways and opportunities to worship God, and to remember and celebrate his goodness as he taught them how they can live for him. And so the theme, again, one of these brain teaser ideas, the theme for the book of Leviticus is we can just see offerings and feasts. So offerings and feasts on that. And so you can see the Levi or the leave on his belt. So that tells us it's the book of Leviticus, and the theme is offerings and feasts. So moving on from there, the next events are in the book of Numbers. I'll point to this map just in a little bit. As the nation of Israel prepares to leave Mount Sinai for the promised land. Now, I don't have the details all on the map here, but basically as they left Egypt, the traditional area of Mount Sinai would probably be in this area. And as they prepared, they prepared to go north to the nation of Israel. Remember last week we talked about that, the nation of Israel, there's four bodies of water, the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and the Mediterranean. This narrow sliver of land where God had promised to Abraham that Abraham and his descendants would be a blessing to all the nations, and that points us to the coming of Christ. So the next events we talk about at this time are the events in the book of Numbers. The nation of Israel prepares to leave Mount Sinai for the promised land, but before leaving, God tells them to take a census by counting all the fighting men that are 20 years old and older. The result? was 600,000, suggests a total population of two to three million people. They leave Mount Sinai, they journey north to a place called Kadesh Barnea. It's an oasis that's just outside the promised land. So as they travel north from Mount Sinai, up in this area, I don't know the exact spot, but you can look on your Bible maps and take a look, they get to Kadesh Barnea. And After spending 400 years in Egypt, seeing God's power to free them, they're at the brink of entering this promised land, something they've been looking forward to for years, this promise that has been passed on to them. But before entering the land, they send in 12 spies, one from each tribe or one from each family. They send in those 12 spies to check out the land of Israel. And The report comes back, they see exactly what God had said, a land that was truly flowing with milk and honey, and all they would need that God would provide for them. And so they were spying in the land. And so 
our two hand signs for the book of Numbers are this. First, they did the census, and so that was counting, and then they did their spying. So it's just going to be with your left hand, we're going to say counting, and then with your right hand, spying. So one more time, counting, spying. Those are the two hand signs for the book of Numbers. So the spies come back and they tell the others about the land, about the produce and all that they had saw, and they give a divided report. Ten of the spies see the size of Israel's enemy and say, there's no way we can take them. We see ourselves as like grasshoppers compared to these people. The ten were looking at themselves instead of God, while two of them saw the size of Israel's God and say, we can do it. God will bring us into the land. Who was right? The two. Who did the people believe? The ten. And so from that point, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Because of their unbelief, they spent the next 40 years wandering one year for every day the spies looked over the land and saw obstacles rather than opportunities for God to show his glory. So the theme for the book of Numbers is wandering. You can see the numbers, they have a compass and a map, but they're wandering in the wilderness. And let's do those two hand signs again. It's just counting and spying. Counting and spying out the land. So every person at that time, 20 years old and older at the time of the census, died during that 40-year period. The Israelites spent these 40 years wandering in the wilderness and dying. And those are our next hand signs to talk about this as well. So it's wandering, dying. One more time, wandering, dying. So let's put those together. Counting, spying, wandering, dying. And somebody had estimated that over that 40-year period, 1.2 million people died, which amounts to a funeral about every 17 minutes. And again, that is also found in the book of Numbers, that tells us about these things. Now, the generation that received the law the first time has passed off the scene. The new generation, 19 years old at the time of the census, grow up to take their place. Moses now brings this new generation to the land of Moab and prepares them to enter into the promised land. He preaches three sermons, repeating the law, to the new generation. The words that he had given to the first generation, Moses repeats those in, again of how you live for the Lord in this new land, how he wants you to live and bring honor and glory to him. So from the Kadesh Barnea wandering in the wilderness, Moses brings the people up to Moab, which is probably just north and east of the Dead Sea. So in this area, and that's where Moses gives them the second law. And that's our last hand sign for this section. Second law. Now, it wasn't a new law, but he gave the same law a second time to prepare this new generation to enter the promised land, to live for the Lord, to be witnesses for him. So after sharing the law with this new generation, Moses dies. And it brings us to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, the end of the Pentateuch at that time. So let's go through all those signs together real quick, and it'll bring us Exodus through Deuteronomy. Here we go. Moses, Passover, Law, Tabernacle, Offerings and Feasts, Counting, Spying, wandering, dying, second law. And that brings us to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. The theme for the book of Deuteronomy is the same as it is the hand sign or the key word that we learn, 
The theme is second law. Now on the brain teaser type of picture, you can see the second law, they're singing a duet, and they're running on me. Duet, run on, run on me, or Deuteronomy. The theme is second law. So let me just review quickly the structure of the book of Genesis. So you can see here, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Joshua, which we'll get into next week. Leviticus was actually given the words there while they were at Mount Sinai, and Deuteronomy was given in the area of Moab as well. So remember, we talked about those books of history. That's when the nation is moving, the movement of the nation toward the promised land at that time. So I pray that over these, this next week that you'd maybe have some opportunity to look into some of those key areas and that God would use this to encourage you to see how the, what the Israelite people lived through, how God was faithful in carrying out his promise and carrying out his purposes and plans. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word we thank you for your faithfulness. And even as we talk this morning, the reminders that you give us to seek after you, to serve you. Father, we thank you for the love that you give us and the picture that you give us of Jesus through the Passover, that he was our spotless lamb that died in our place, that took our sins on himself because we couldn't pay for them on our own. That if we trust him and put our faith in him, Lord, that we can be forgiven of that sin and be restored in that relationship with you. And we thank you for that, the love that you have for each one of us. And so we pray that you'll be with us over this next week just that you would remind us of that love and teach us more and more how to live and serve you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mark, for those words, for the encouragement, and uh, just for the example of the, the Old Testament saints and what they went through as well. Really, our prayer, after hearing that, is, is to just pray for holiness and faithfulness and righteousness. So sing those words with us this morning, church, as a prayer together. Here we go, holiness first. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Is what you want from me. Faithfulness next. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. Take our lives, Lord. That's the prayer this morning. Take my heart and form it. Take my will, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Righteousness. Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. Let's pray these words again. So take my heart.
For the benediction today, I'd like to share from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Hope you all have a great week, and again, want to wish our moms a happy Mother's Day.